All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the joint hearing of the Committees on Energy and Environmental Protection and Committee on Water and Land. It is 8.30 a.m., Thursday, February 2nd, and we are in conference room 325. We have three agendas today. We do have your written testimony. It's been reviewed, um, and we have a lot of bills to get through, so um, we don't have a time limit on testimony, but we encourage everyone to be as succinct as possible. Um, and with that, we will get started on the first bill. This is the Green Amendment Bill, so proposing an amendment to Article One of the Constitution of the State of Hawaii to recognize and protect the inherent and inalienable right of all people to clean water and air, a healthful environment and climate, healthy native ecosystems and beaches. And first up to testify is DLNR. Aloha chairs and vice chairs and members of the committee. I'm Laura Kaakua, governor's nominee for the deputy director of DLNR. And I just wanted to share this morning um, to clarify that the department supports um, the intent of this amendment and is balancing that with the guidance from the Department of Attorney General. Um, and so I also wanted to note that um, we support the intent of this uh, amendment um, and we also wanted to share that um, we hope we have to think about um, that this as having reciprocity so in uh, through a Hawaii lens if we're giving um, making it clear it, it should already be there but making it clear that the people have a right to clean environment healthy waters um, then there also needs to be reciprocity with um, our community as a whole taking care of our lands and waters. And so we can do that through um, stringent um, regulations, following our other environmental laws, and also adequately uh, funding and prioritizing our lands and waters. And uh, Pua Ayu and I are here if you have any questions. Mahalo. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll take questions at the end of all the testimony. And next we have um, Department of the Attorney General, I think, uh, on Zoom. No, nope, not present yet. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning, Chairs Loan and Ichiyama and members of the community. I am Blair Goto, Deputy Attorney General. I think everyone who lives in Hawaii should be in favor of clean water and a healthy environment. Our concern that we express today is not with the end, but rather with the means employed by this bill. Article 11, sections one and nine already require the state to protect Hawaii's natural beauty and resources and establish a right to a clean and healthful environment. Our concern is that the constitutional amendment proposed by this bill could be construed to limit the legislature's power to regulate the environment in the future, and it could call into question existing environmental laws. So I am here for any questions, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And then we have <coughs> Kauai Climate Action Coalition in support, Surfrider Foundation, Hawaii Region in support, Zero Waste Kauai in support, Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Thank you, Chair Lowen, Chair Ichiyama, Vice Chair Cochran, Vice Chair Poipoi, po 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 thank you, and members of the committee. Uh, my name's Ted Bolin. I'm representing not only Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition, but also the Climate Protectors Hawaii on this one, because it has broad application to so many. We currently do have a right to clean air and water in the Constitution, but it's not enough. It is as defined by law. And that means that right is only as good as the laws and as the enforcement of the laws. And as we have seen in recent days, uh, it doesn't always work. If you look at the example in Red Hill, that was a permitted facility under law. And we have spills of oil, we have spills of PFAS. So we need to have a fundamental right recognized. We have rights in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights for so many things, but we don't have one for environment. And isn't, is there anything more fundamental than a right to a clean air, clean water, uh, healthy ecosystems, climate, et cetera? 
So this, this is a very much a needed piece of uh, legislation. It, uh, those rights should be up on the same level with freedom of religion and assembly. Three other states have done so without constitutional problems or without a lot of litigation, by the way. So if uh, current laws, rules um, are not adequate or if they're not being implemented enough, uh, then sh there should be a right to take it before judges. That's our system. We have three branches of government. If you have a right, you have a right to redress, you should be able to go to court and redress it. As the families who suffered in the Red Hill example should have had the right to go to court. And they did not have that. Uh, this, I should finally add that this bill only goes to the ballot. This does not approve a constitutional amendment if the legislature passes this bill and the governor signs it. It means it just goes to the uh, citizens of the state. And this should be a right for the people to decide. The right, whether they want a right to fundamental right to the environmental protection that's uh, enshrined in this uh, bill, uh, let's, let's give it to the people to decide that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Um, then we have Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii in support, Aimua Alliance in support, Americans for Democratic Action in support, Association of Native Hawaiian Physicians in support, 350 Hawaii in support, Our Revolution Hawaii uh, on Zoom, Dave Molinick. Uh, is Dave Mullenix on Zoom? Okay, we'll move on. Kauai Climate Action Coalition in support. And Trinity United Methodist Church in support and Pono Hawaii Initiative in support. We also have testimony from 43 additional individuals in support, all in support. Uh, is there anyone else here or on uh, the Zoom call who wants to testify on this measure? I, I am here. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Uh, you know, Dave, to go first. <clears throat> go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> I don't know. The computer was locked up there for some reason. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Thank you very much. Um, the, it's important to realize that um, there's the arguments that have been, been put forward by are not accurate, and it's important that we focus on what's accurate. Uh, your vote on passage of the Green Amendment will not amend our state constitution. It will simply give the people the right to decide. Given the constitution is by and for the people of Hawaii, it is that you give us the opportunity to vote on whether to amend and include the environment, environmental rights. Um, this proposed um, amendment will not prevent our legislature or any other government uh, from taking robust, appropriate, and all needed action to protect our rights aspect of our environment. The amendment will actually strengthen and guide the ability of, our, of all arms of government here in Hawaii to protect the basic human rights of our people to a clean, safe, and healthy environment. In fact, the, the three states that have passed it have not had these problems at all. In uh, no way can the, the amendment be argued to undermine our authority or obligation to protect the environment. It actually heightens. It's ensuring we do not use our powers in any way that will infringe upon these essential rights and freedoms. Um, just a couple of the points. Uh, we're all aware that situation, we're talking about, oh, we already have these ability to protect uh, us, but this is based on the laws that are on the books. And just as was mentioned earlier, we already had those laws on the books, yet they did not prevent the Red Hill crisis. If we had a Green Amendment, then it could have prevented it. The same thing with the PFAS contamination. And over on Kauai, um, we had the GMO pesticide contamination um, that had to go to a lawsuit. We would have prevented having that lawsuit if we'd had a Green Amendment. So uh, all the arguments that have been put forward are based on what if, or it's possible, or this could happen, but the reality is the things that actually are happening are absolutely different. In other states, uh, there exist these kinds of enjoy rights. The Attorney General's offices have been able to use the Constitution right and obligation as a stronger foundation for securing enforcement of existing environmental laws and making sure the courts do not allow for weaker interpretation of the laws that the Attorney General would argue for. Overall, this proposed amendment cannot be said to undermine existing laws or put them in jeopardy 
uh, contrary, it will strengthen them and simply make sure they're interpreted by the most robust way necessary to ensure that our people are able to access and benefit from clean water, air, and thriving native ecosystems. Um, so, you know, once again, thank you so much for uh, some testimony. Um, this, it, uh, once again, you folks are not voting on passing this, but it, this has now goes, will go to the people once you pass it, and it should be up for our decision what we would like for our, for our rights. But the AG's uh, argument would, if the AG was, was, you know, before we had the right for women to write the vote, or black people the right to vote, these are the same arguments those AGs would have used at that time because those were the laws of the land. Think times changed, and uh, and we would know not, we would not have AGs telling us today. Oh well, you know this could open us up to other lawsuits, etc. Because people say we want to be free. You know it's a new time, it's a new era, and it's time for us to have uh, our constitutional right to a free and clean environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is anyone else here to testify on this? All right. If not, we'll move on to questions. Um, I'll start uh, with... Oh, Suman Gorman Chang. Hi, I was here on Zoom to testify, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning, Chair Lerwin and Vice Chair Cochran and the committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. I'm Susan Gorman Chang and I'm representing Trinity United Methodist Church and we support the Green Amendment. The United Methodist Church's 2016 Book of Resolutions, number 1033, Caring for Creation, a call to stewardship and justice, ludicates our principles, beliefs, and responsibilities in regards to safeguarding and defending the earth. This resolution 1033 starts by clearly stating our covenant with God calls us to steward, protect, and defend God's creation. Um, it also uh, illuminates further, we call on governments to support careful management of agricultural lands, protection of forests, and preservation of biodiversity among both plants and animals. HB 444 aligns with the stated values of the United Methodist Church, and we strongly support HB 444. And as others, um, just like David had stated, uh, the current laws and regulations have not protected us. Red Hill is the most recent example, and we do need um, this to go forward. Mahal. All right, thank you. Anyone else here to testify on this measure? All right, if not, we'll go to questions. Questions, members? Rep. Souza, go ahead. I have a question for the Department of the Attorney General. Thank you. Um, you know, although I can certainly appreciate the sentiment of, of what we're trying to do here, just as you had mentioned, um, and, and as far as the intent of, of the language here, um, do you think that there's a vagueness issue as far as the, the way that it's presented? For instance, um, would any sort of emissions be deemed unconstitutional if this were to be implemented? That's certainly a possibility. Um, I can't really predict the future, but I can say that there are circumstances where that could be alleged as a reason to invalidate a current regulatory scheme. Right. Um, I think that perhaps we're not simply recognizing the right in the language, but what we're doing is we're ensuring the right. Um, and it's very strong language is shall be protected and shall not be infringed. Um, so I think that the title of the bill, um, which is, you know, which points to the recognition is very different from the language um, of the question that um, would be asked on the actual ballot. Do you think that's an issue as well? Um, I don't have the answer to that right now. I think I could certainly look into that if that's what you would like. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, members? Sure. Uh, for the AG, thank you for being here today. Uh, following up uh, more so on the state's liability, if I live next to a landfill and I have the right to clean air and clean water, can I sue you? Well, certainly, um, if you can, anyone can file a lawsuit well, as to yeah, generically, of course. Right. But this, in terms of the air, you know, there's a new thing called environmental racism that has come up, and this bill looks like it would be a clear way of getting a uh, liability or a good suit from the state, which has very deep pockets. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's certainly a possibility. Uh, our concern would be that if there is an exi our existing 
environmental regulations that regulate air quality that allow certain limits to uh, be in place for a landfill, for example, that this, uh, assuming this amendment were uh, accepted by the electorate, that it could be a basis to challenge the existing and enforcement of existing um, regulations or limits as not being uh, consistent with a helpful environment. So I believe that is the position we're uh, presenting well, today. Okay, well, uh, Mr. Attorney General, what uh, if I live next, if I may, at second, just second one question. Last, one last question. One last question. If I live downwind on a highway, a freeway, which study after study has indicated more diseases, more cancer, more kind of detrimental thing, can I sue you also? My point is, is this going to open us up to where if we don't have everybody at great health, they're going to come after you guys or us? That is certainly uh, a possibility. I can't say that that's uh, you know, likely or uh, a likelihood of success on the merits, but it's certainly a possibility. Our concern, again, is with the complication that this amendment would work on existing regulatory frameworks and enforcement of them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Any further questions? All right. So if not, we will move on uh, to the next bill on our agenda. We're getting into the, I think we have uh, five, five bills relating to cesspools and um, wastewater. Many of these are implementing recommendations of the cesspool conversion. Uh, working group as well. And again, just reminding everyone here and on Zoom that we do have a long agenda um, and that we have read your written testimony. So first up on uh, the, for the cesspool bills is House Bill 1396. This establishes and appropriates funds for a pilot program within the Environmental Management Division of the Department of Health to work with each county to identify a priority area to expand the county sewer system or other centralized treatment system to connect individual properties in the priority area and reduce or eliminate cesspools in the identified area. And first up to testify is Department of Health. Good morning, chairs. Good morning, vice chairs and committee members. Senior Pruder with the Department of Health. We stand by our written testimony and support. Thank you. And then we have University of Hawaii in support, County of Kauai Managing Director in support, uh, Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management in support. Democratic Party uh, of Hawaii Environmental Caucus in support. Uh, Hawaii Realtors in support. We have, oh, hi, Lindsay, go ahead. Good morning, Lindsay Garcia for Hawaii Realtors. Uh, we're in strong support of this bill. Uh, we believe that uh, you know converting 83,000 cesspools is a massive infrastructure project that requires proper planning across various stakeholders both uh, government institutions, including uh, private and um, public partners. Affordability is key. 97% of homeowners will struggle with affording conversion. Even with a $10,000 tax credit, 82% of homeowners will still struggle. As such, we applaud the state for taking leadership on this matter through the establishment of this pilot program. We believe it will be extremely beneficial to have the Department of Health work with the counties to Recording identify- Recording stopped. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, identify uh, priority areas, collaborate with stakeholders and homeowners, and provide much needed funding to convert cesspools. This pilot project can also serve as a template for future initiatives involving cesspool conversion efforts. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have uh, VI, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations, I think maybe on Zoom. Okay, we'll move on to Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Thank you, Chair Lowen, Chair Ichiyama, Vice Chair Cochran, Vice Chair Poi Poi. <laughs> Thank you all members. Uh, this bill makes sense. I served for four years with Rep Lowen. I want to thank her for her efforts on the cesspool conversion working group as well as Sina and, Pruder uh, and others. Um, one of the questions is how many cesspools we can eliminate by expanding sewers. And this pilot program is a good step toward that in finding out which, which places the counties uh, might reduce cesspools uh, by getting them onto sewers as opposed to having to worry about individual wastewater systems. So it's a good bill. I urge the committee to pass it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And then we have three individuals in support 
And that's all the testimony um, that was submitted in advance. Is there anyone else here to testify on this measure? If not members, questions? Rep Ward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the former gentleman. Thank you, Rep Ward. Uh, the question is, have all the, when did we first allow cesspools? And have all the counties consistently allowed this or have some pulled back rather than the state acting as we have been in the last couple of years? Cesspools are a traditional um, plantation era, cheap way to dump your waste into the groundwater so that it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, so that's, that's the history back into the 18th, 19th yeah, lava century. Tubes on the Big Island, I understand. Half of these uh, cesspools are on the Big Island. Yeah. And, and so there's a big need. Um, recently, in I think 2016, we uh, banned new cesspools which were being put on the Big Island until then. You're talking about the state, though, when we, when you say we. We, the uh, state by rule. But no county has ever jumped ahead like they have in some places on electrical production. Recording in progress. Jumped ahead and did what? It, in terms of having standards ahead of what the state has otherwise set. Um, no, I think the... That, okay, so the, all, the, all, all the counties are equally guilty. That, that's basically the point that I'm trying to bring. I, I don't want to assess guilt, but everybody's, <laughs> every, every single county has a significant number of cesspools that need upgrading. Okay, this is a way forward. Thank you. It, but the point is it's about time. If we've been allowing it that time and now we're just waking up to it, that seems a bit surprising to me. That's I, my point. I, I couldn't agree more that okay. now is the time. It's a problem that we've uh, looked the other way on for a long time, and it's polluted our waters, and it's uh, time to fix it. Exactly. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions, members? There's lots of successful bills, so lots of opportunities for future questions. Um, next on the agenda is House Bill 440. This uh, reinstates or establishes the income tax credit uh, for uh, 10000 for the cost of upgrading and converting a qualified cesspool to an approved system or connecting to a sewer system. And then um, it also requires a seller's disclosure form uh, to make sure that buyers are aware that they're buying a property with a cesspool and that there are laws on the books regarding when those need to be converted. And first up to testify, we have Department of Taxation. Good morning, chairs, vice chairs, and members of the committee. My name is Sharon Tagami, and I'm here on behalf of the Department of Taxation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The department stands on its written testimony, and I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And then Department of Health. Uh, the department stands on its written testimony and support. Thank you. <coughs> University of Hawaii Sea Grant Program in support. Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management in support. Democratic Party of Hawaii Environmental Caucus in support. Hawaii Realtors. Thank you, Lindsay Garcia again from the Hawaii Association of Realtors. So we are in support of this testimony or this uh, this bill, but we do offer a few comments. Uh, as I stated earlier, affordability is key. So we support any in any and all assistance that be can given to homeowners and communities to aid in cesspool conversion. We do want to note, however, that Hawaii Realtors already has a disclosure <coughs> provision related to cesspools in our seller's real property disclosure statement. So the provision that provision of the bill may not be necessary. Uh, we have a standard forms committee that continuously reviews and creates our real estate contracts to ensure it's current with industry standards and the law. Additionally, the standard forms committee has created a subcommittee in order to uh, explicitly explore the accessible conversion issue further with regard to standard forms. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next up we have uh, VI Wastewater Alternatives and innovation, Stuart Pullman in support. Uh, Tax Foundation of Hawaii uh, uh, on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, uh, chair, chairs, uh, uh, vice chairs, and members of the committees. Uh, Tom Yamachika for Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Uh, we will stand on a written testimony and be available for questions. Thank you. And then we have. Um, one individual offering comments and four in support. Is there anyone else here to testify on this measure? Ted Bolin again for the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. This is a good bill. Uh, we have had some experience with the tax credit. Uh, not a lot of people signed up, but for those who do, it's a benefit. 
The seller disclosure form, yes, there are uh, provisions existing in the papers that you signed today, but they're kind of buried. And people should be aware when they buy a home that they have a cesspool that is going to need to be upgraded in a few years, perhaps. So it's very important to also pass that provision. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, anyone else here to testify? If not members, questions? Rep Ward. Thank you. Uh, the proverbial do tax, do you have a uh, estimate of what this may uh, cause as a dent or just a little pimple? What no. does it look like? What's your estimations? Um, I'm sorry, but currently right now we do not have an estimate. Um, I can get back to you later when we do have an estimate. You know, the, the, I'm going to speak as a member of the Finance Committee. It's really frustrating when we have a bill that's going to cost money. Okay. But especially like when the governor says we're going to take away GET tax, if you guys don't have the, the amount, we're, we're kind of putting blindfolders on. Anyways, that's my soliloquy. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Grab a oh, thank you. Uh, for realtors? Good morning. Good morning. Lindsay, is it? Yes. Aloha. And um, you mentioned that on the form, the sellers um, will check, acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But what about the buyer? The I buyer. I mean, it's one thing about the seller saying, yeah, I know there's a, we need to cesspool conversion. Mm -hmm. But what about the purchaser? Are they acknowledged? Is there a way for them to say, yeah, we, the seller notified me, the buyer, the purchaser, that this is, you know, comes with the property? That's a that's a good question. So my understanding is uh, the way the the way the forms work is that the the seller acknowledges all basically lots of issues or um, the condition of the home or anything, and then that is given to the the buyer to review and basically acknowledge receipt. Like I understand. So this is it's one of many um, items that would be on the standard form that the seller indicates, and then the buyer then takes a look at and is like, okay, I understand. Yeah, this is the condition of the home. Sorry, a follow up. Yeah. But I think um, it'd be helpful that we double check and triple check that sure. yes, you acknowledge the seller, the realtor, but what about the purchaser, the buyer on that behalf? Mm -hmm. Another box or something saying, oh, I understand this and yes, I got it, I understand it. And Understood. I can look into that you. further and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Rep Chun, did you have a question? No, okay, I have some questions. Lindsay, you can come back. Um, First, I, like, I appreciate the comments about affordability. I think we're really aware of that. And this tax credit would complement the grant program that is uh, focused towards low and moderate income at 140% AMI or below that we passed last year. Um, regarding the seller's disclosure form, what other, kind of pull, what other subject matter is pulled out and currently has a disclosure form? I mean, I know there's, there's a bog, lead paint, mm -hmm. asbestos, um, sea level <laughs> rise. Is, is that the four? What else gets pulled out with a separate disclosure form? That's a good question. I can uh, see if I can pull the form for you and send it to your office. My understanding is that it's a very long, uh, long form with lots and lots of information. I see that representative is No, no, not there's here. a separate, uh, the seller's disclosure form is a long form with a lot of little tiny boxes mm -hmm. where the seller can check yes, no, or not to my knowledge on any number of topics. But there's other topics that have been deemed to kind of rise to a higher level of requiring notification and there's a separate form that has to um, be signed by the buyer and it kind of is about things that are knowable facts. So the seller can't say not to my knowledge. Is there VOG? Not to my knowledge. Is there lead paint? Not to my knowledge. Is there asbestos? Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Sea level rise inundation area? Not to my knowledge. We have data. It's a knowable fact. And the buyer, it's important, it's relevant, it's a material fact the buyer should know. So I w if you can look into what other forms exist for that. So that's what we're asking for with this. And I think the idea, I mean, I'm curious if you think it's acceptable for a seller to be able to check a box that says not to my knowledge. If their buyer is buying a property with a cesspool, which is a knowable fact, even if the seller doesn't know, the realtor should be able to look it up. And I mean, I think, I would think the realtors would want to support this because I think you would really be opening yourselves up to a lot of legal liability um, if people are made unaware of the existence of a cesspool given the financial burden that you yourself pointed out exists. Exactly. Well, 
Thank you, Representative. I can, I can definitely look into this a little bit further to, to understand exactly how this looks and to contact your office to ensure that uh, it meets your vision of what you're looking for. Okay. Thank you. I, and just the question was, sorry, I did have a question. Do you think it's acceptable given everything that's happening with cesspools right now in, in law and you know in terms of the impacts they cause to have a seller be allowed to check a box that says not to my knowledge well, whether it's acceptable uh well you know that's a that's a good question and i think it's a good opportunity for us to take a look at our at our forms to ensure that everyone feels comfortable with the way that it's worded okay but it is a yes or no question is it acceptable to sit for a seller when you can easily look up if a property has a cesspool? Should they be allowed to check a box that says not to my knowledge and have the buyer be unaware that the property they're purchasing has a cesspool that might cost tens of thousands of dollars to convert and is conversion is required by law? We think the buyer should be made aware. I guess mm -hmm. you can't answer that question, but I would hope that the answer would be no, that's not acceptable. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Members, any further questions? Rep Kahaloa. Mahalo, Chair. <clears throat> Just a comment, um, when purchasing a home, on that disclosure form it was indicated to my household that it was septic and we were like, wow, we, we scored because in Kona there's a lot of cesspools. So we thought we might be whew, out of the loop of the rare properties that maybe have already converted and that information was actually inaccurate but we know where to look for that information as an informed household, as a local family. And just noting in the Kona districts, we have a lot of families, people moving in who don't know what cesspool okay. issues are arising in our community. So extra layers of information to confirm that cesspools are in their district and then they have to convert by 2050, I think is critically important. Just like forms that talk about um, you are in a tsunami zone <laughs> or lava zone, extra layers of completing paperwork are really, really helpful for people purchasing a home. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I want to just remind members that we have time for questions, not comments, just because we have a lot of agenda to get through. So we'll limit, limit it to questions. Uh, Rep Ward, did you have a question? Okay, moving on to the next bill on our agenda. House Bill 180 relating to cesspools. So this creates within the Department of Health's wastewater branch a cesspool conversion section, which will be responsible for facilitating conversion of cesspools in the state, establishes uh, additional positions and funds those positions. So first up to testify, we have Department of Land and Natural Resources. Aloha, Laura Kaakua with DLNR. Uh, we stand on our written testimony, and I have Brian Nielsen here from Division of Aquatic Resources. If there are any questions, mahalo. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Department of Health. The, the Department of Health stands on its written testimony in strong support. Thank you. Next, we have University of Hawaii in support. Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management in support. Democratic Party of Hawaii Environmental Caucus in support. Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Thank you, Chairs, Vice Chairs, members of the committee. Ted Boland for Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. As I said, I served on the uh, cesspool conversion working group. And this is an important bill uh, in terms of implementation. The Department of Health uh, has limited resources. I was their attorney from 2006 until 2020. And I know how limited their resources are. They need more people. Um, and having a separate section with uh, a couple of additional people uh, would really help. So this is a very important bill the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition strongly supports. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have um, Hawaii Realtors in support. Thank you. We provide comments on this measure. We definitely su uh, appreciate and support the intent. Uh, while it may vary greatly on uh, existing infrastructure and property location, it can take uh, eight to nine months or longer for a homeowner to convert their cesspool to a Department of Health approved wastewater system. Um, steps include not limited to architects drawing up site plans, civil engineers drawing up and submitting the system, DOH approval, engaging a contractor, permitting construction, and engineers getting final DOH approval. Uh, as such, it is crucial that we properly plan and find ways to assist communities and homeowners with resources and manpower. 
um, we believe that moving up the mandate does not necessarily solve the financial dilemma as well, though we appreciate all, any and all efforts uh, in order to provide financial assistance as well as wastewater and uh, infrastructure planning. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have VI, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations in support, now on Zoom. Hi, good morning, and sorry for the uh, technical difficulties earlier that I couldn't be there. Um, my name is Stuart Coleman, and I'm the Executive Director of VI, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. Uh, we stand on our testimony, but just want to reiterate uh, what Ted Boland said. Um, I was on the cesspool conversion working group, and right now we do about 150 to um, the Department of Health approves about 150 to 200 cesspool conversions a year. And to reach our mandate um, of converting all cesspools by 2050, we need to do more than 3,000 a year. So they will absolutely need these workers. And I think our cesspool conversion group was, was you know, very united and very strong in um, urging this reform. Mahalo. Thank you. And that's uh, all the testimony we have submitted. Is there anyone else here to testify on this measure on Zoom or in person? If not, members' questions? Rep Ward. Uh, the gentleman who just testified. Uh, what is is the f slow pace of conversion because of money, because of t of technical know-how, or what, 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 or permitting, or what, what, what seems to be the backlog? What's the major reasons? You know, I think there's um, a, a lot of reasons. Thank you for the question. Um, probably the main one is there was some uncertainty about um, you know when they were going to start really enforcing the conversions and. Um, and every, you know, a lot of people are waiting for the cesspool conversion working group to wrap up, which we just did. And so I think people are waiting for their final recommendations. And this was at the top of our list. And so I think um, there are a number of things. But as Ted Bullen said, it's it is, a, I think, in talking with Cena Pruder, they don't have enough staff um, really focused on this issue. They're already busy with so many of the other things that they have to do. Um, so I think that's the main reason. So it sounds like the ball is in the government's court, so to speak. A little bit, yeah. I would, I would agree in that you know that they just need uh, people who can really um, help facilitate these conversions and process the permitting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, members. Other members' questions. All right. If not, we'll move on to the next bill, House Bill One Eighty One. Uh, this is implementing the recommendation of the cesspool conversion working group to accelerate dates for required upgrades um, for priority one cesspools to 2030, priority level two cesspools to 2035. This is based on the um, cesspool prioritization tool that was developed as a work product of the cesspool conversion working group. Um, and first up to testify, we have Department of Land and Natural Resources. Thank you. And uh, next we have Department of Health. The department stands on its written testimony and strong Thank you. Um, University of Hawaii Sea Grant support. Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management in support. Democratic Party of Hawaii Environmental Caucus in support. Hawaii Reef and Ocean <coughs> Coalition. Thank you, Chairs, Vice Chairs, members of the committee. Ted Boland for Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. The major recommendation, in my opinion, of the cesspool conversion working group after four years of study was that we need to accelerate some of the cesspool conversions that are currently set for 2050, uh, set by 2050. Uh, we can't do them all at once, and we need to get, our, our study indicates that we've got uh, water pollution problems that need to be addressed now, not in 2049. So this is a very important bill. I would say that maybe the most of these five bills, the one that I think is the most important. Uh, the priority one cesspools would need to be upgraded by 2030. There's about 13,000 of those. The priority two by 2035, there's about 12,000 of those. The remaining, I think it's 55,000, but some number like that, uh, almost 70% of the cesspools would still be upgraded in 2070. So what we're doing here is trying to accelerate the most polluting 30% of cesspools. And let's get started on those, um, stagger it so that people can get it done, and, and move forward on this problem that has been ignored for too long. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Hawaii Realtors with comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to 
stand on our comments. I, I apologize. We are a strong supporter of the 2FT for DOHA. I say the name like testimony for the group, uh, not the previous, but you all understand my position. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vi Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. Stuart, go ahead. Okay, good morning. Uh, chairs and committee members, Stuart Coleman from VI, and um, we would stand on our testimony and just add in, um, in support that um, just to remind people of how serious this issue is, they uh, did a water quality study in um, Hawaii Paradise Park um, on the Big Island and found that 50% um, of the private drinking water wells they sampled had fecal indicator bacteria in them from uh, from cesspool. So this is a very serious public health and environmental issue. And we have a lot of bays across the, the state that are listed as with the EPA as 303D impaired bodies of water, seriously impaired where we're, it's uh, really hurting our coral reef cover. So yeah, I would agree that, you know, the these two bills, 180 and 181 are probably the top um, priority, priorities of the cesspool conversion working group. Model. Thank you. And um, uh, that is all the test. Oh, we have additional testimony from four individuals in support. Is there anyone else here to testify on this measure? If not, members, any questions? Rep Cochran. Thank you. And for um, Vai? Aloha. Aloha. Uh, <clears throat> are you aware of the, the state of Hawaii being having the highest MRSA rates in the nation? and if this has anything to do with that? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Representative. We, um, we have the highest rates of staff and MRSA in the country. Um, I think it's four, time, four times the rate of staff and two times the rate of MRSA, which is the flesh-eating bacteria, which is extremely dangerous. And even though we can't say that this is directly from um, the cesspools, there is, you know, cause, uh, correlation does not mean cause. It, it is most likely definitely a major contributing factor to those high, high infection rates. Thank you for your comments. Thank Mama. you. Thank you. Other, other questions, members? Um, I, I guess maybe for um, Department of Land and Natural Resources, uh, can you just Tell us more about the impacts that cesspool runoff has on coral reefs, because I think with the Water Land Committee here as well, it, it's just we want to better understand that impact. Thanks for the question, Chair Lowen. Brian Nielsen, Administrator for Division of Aquatic Resources. Uh, so uh, management of cesspools is definitely outside of uh, aquatic resources, Kuleana, but the reason why we're uh, testifying in support today is uh, there's more and more literature and, and studies coming out showing the impacts of uh, nutrients via cesspools, um, either uh, degrading corals, um, you know, causing algae blooms that overgrow the, the reefs and kill the corals, but also resilience to coral bleaching events. There's more, more studies showing that um, managing nutrient pollution is one of the best things we can do to help our reefs um, be resilient from um, you know these uh, heat heat waves that we're getting and causing coral bleaching events. So that that's why we're supporting. Right, and even even if we weren't also facing this you know the ocean warming issues, the the impacts I would would the impacts still be present? There would still be impacts to the reef from the cesspool runoff. Absolutely, yeah, and um, herbivore um, fish, you know, other important fisheries, we're seeing impacts from uh, nutrients on, on those as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, members? Okay, great, moving quickly. Um, okay, we're on to our last uh, crappy bill of the day. Um, <laughs> Sorry. What was that? <laughs> uh, House Bill 587, um, this is relating to wastewater management, and this directs um, each county to uh, conduct a comprehensive integ integrated wastewater management plan report and um, report to the legislature and just look at those countywide needs so that we understand where there should be sewer, where other options are. Um, you know, more viable and what the big picture is so that we can better implement the plan strategically. And first up is uh, Department of Health. 
The department stands on its written testimony and support. Thank you. And then we have University of Hawaii Sea Grant in support. Uh, Hawaii County of Depart Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management in support. Democratic Party of Hawaii Environmental Caucus in support. Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Thank you, Chair Lowen, Chairs, Vice Chairs, members of the committee. Ted Boland for Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. First, I want to thank Mr. Nielsen of DAR for explaining somewhat the uh, problem with nutrients and how it's affecting the reefs. I want to emphasize on behalf of the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition that our reefs are dying from heat. And we have to do what we can to save them uh, so they have some resiliency and some time to survive. Our economy, our way of life depends on a healthy reefs. If we lose those, we lose our shoreline, our tourists, our way of life. So this is a really big issue for the whole state is to get onto this. And nutrients come from cesspools are a big part of what is harming the reefs. So we want to get this problem under control. With regard to the bill that's at hand, uh, House Bill 587, this is just makes sense. This is the county um, being, at, each of the counties being asked to file integrated wastewater management reports, do good planning so that we can figure out where to expand sewers, where to put in individual wastewater systems, et cetera. So uh, I strongly support this bill on behalf of Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And then the Hawaii Realtors. Thank you, Lindsay Garcia for the Hawaii Association of Realtors again. We are in strong support of this bill. Uh, proper planning, as I've mentioned, and coordination is key for this massive infrastructure undertaking. We believe this bill is an important next step to be able to determine which areas uh, where sewer can be built out and where other conversions are possible, as well as identifying funding mechanisms and developing financing, financing strategies to assist with cesspool conversions. And we applaud the state and the chair's effort in particular in taking the lead on this issue. Thank you. And thank you, I think Realtors helped work on that bill, so we appreciate that. And then we have um, Vi on Zoom. Hi, uh, Mahalo, Mahalo Chairs. Um, we stand in, um, in support of this bill and we'll stand on our written testimony. Thank you. And then we have five individuals in support. And anyone else here to testify on this measure? If not, members, any questions? Last chance for questions about cesspools. Rep Morikawa. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure who can, maybe Ted, you can help me with this because you were on the working group. Yes. We know that the, most of the burden is going to fall on the county's infrastructure. Has that discussion happened with the counties through your group? Because I don't see any testimony except for Hawaii. The counties what, what they know about what is expected of them because this is a huge amount of funding being that they have to get the infrastructure for the treatment plants and the sewer lines hooked up if we, you know, we, we want to speed it up. Has that discussion happened? Yes, in the sense that all of the counties, including Kauai, were represented on the cesspool conversion working group. Thank you for your question. It's a good one. Uh, there is a lot of money involved no matter what we do. One of the things that's going to be expensive is to expand the sewers. But uh, with help, I think that needs to occur. Um, there are places on Kauai I know could benefit from this. There's another bill that provides a pilot to, for each of the counties to uh, do more planning and figure out where they can uh, financially uh, in, um, wisely uh, make investments to expand and where they can do cluster systems uh, privately and where there can be um, more individual wastewater systems that don't pollute as much as cesspools do. Okay, so you. all those things are, are under consideration. Thank you hear. very much. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, quick follow-up, I guess. Um, just under the law, uh, just to clarify, is it is wastewater infrastructure is county or state responsibility? County responsibility. And um, uh, in terms of permitting the new cesspools for years and years, I mean, that also was a decision made by counties or some counties. Correct. Hawaii County being especially bad. I, I would add that the federal government uh, and the Department of Health passing uh, money down on this uh, uh, state revolving funds has, has financed a lot of the uh, sewer improvements. Um, but yes, it is a county function. Yeah. And then the, despite that it's a county function, what you just said, there's a lot of federal and state funding that has been made available and continues to be made available to the counties. Correct, and I hope will in the future to a larger extent be made available because this is gonna be very expensive for homeowners and for counties. Yes. And we wanna get as much federal money as we can. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, any more questions on this measure? All right, um, we will move on to the last bill on this agenda. 
This is relating to renewable energy, and this, um, uh, I'll summarize, it kind of expedites the permitting process for residential solar and smaller commercial systems. Um, and uh, directs the counties to implement an online permitting system for certain types, types of projects. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Hawaii State Energy Office with comments uh, on, the, on Zoom, <coughs> possibly. Here. Oh, hi, Maria, I didn't see you. Good morning, Maria Tomei, Hawaii State Energy Office. Good morning, chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee. You have our written comments, and we are here to answer questions. Thank you for hearing this bill. Thank you. And um, we have the Chamber of Sustainable Commerce in support, Hawaii Unified Industries LLC in support. Um, there's a number of individuals from Hawaii and Unified Industries that submitted testimony in support. Solar Services, Hawaii in support. Um, Green Power Projects LLC in support, Grand Solar Inc. in support. Kauai Island Utility Cooperative with comments. Um, Hawaii Food Industry Association. Thank you, Chair Lauren. Lauren Zorbel on behalf of Hawaii Food Industry Association, which represents over 200 um, food industry members, including retailers, suppliers, convenience stores, distributors. Uh, we are in strong support of this measure. This is actually one of our priority issues this year. Um, at our annual conference, we asked members what was their number one issue holding them back from um, pursuing renewable energy, and they listed by a 75% margin permitting um, as what was holding them back. So this is a really important measure. It would help to make the food industry more sustainable, but also more resilient so that we could continue to operate um, in times when the um, the uh, the uh, <laughs> the system goes down, and it would help to help us feed the rest of the state. So, um, we really appreciate your support of this measure. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Malama Solar in support, Sierra Club of Hawaii in support, Climate Protectors Hawaii in support. Ted Boland for the Climate Protectors Hawaii. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chairs, members of the committee. This is a really good idea. This would e expedite permitting for solar projects. Uh, get rid of some of the um, administrative barriers that have held it back. It's been a, a, a this kind of uh, system has been used in other states. It's worked there, and I think it could work here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have uh, Makaha Cultural Learning Center in support, Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii in support, Kauai Climate Action Coalition in support, Sun Nova Energy in support, or on Zoom. Catherine Wyskowski on Zoom. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you, Chairs, Vice Chairs, and members of the committee so much for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Catherine Wiskowski, and I'm here on behalf of Sonova Energy. Sonova Energy is a leading residential solar and energy storage service provider with over 245,000 customers across the United States and its territories, including Hawaii. Uh, the implementation uh, proposed by HB 195 of Solar App or a functionally equivalent technology for permitting will facilitate more efficient permitting processes and give residents a better experience when going solar. Um, it will also allow for the larger community to meet clean energy goals. Uh, supporting efficient and timely installation of rooftop solar is critically important to addressing climate change. Um, you have my written comments for all other reasons. You should support this bill. Thank you so much for allowing Sonova to provide a testimony on HB 195. Um, we really believe this bill will help the residents of Hawaii save money and support climate resilience goals. Great, thank you. And then we have Hawaii Solar Energy Association also on Zoom. Good morning, Chairs. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to testify in strong support of this bill. I'm Rocky Mould. I'm the Executive Director of HSCA. Uh, this bill offers a series of measures uh, to address significant permitting challenges that we've faced uh, over the years and been trying to work on in Hawaii. Um, so we really uh, appreciate your consideration of this bill. Uh, I'll stand on our written comments, uh, and I'm here to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then um, uh, we have Association of Native Hawaiian Physicians in support, 350 Hawaii in support, uh, Board of Professional Engineers, Architects, Surveyors, and Landscapers on Zoom. 
Hello, good morning, chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee. My name is Sheena Choi. I'm the executive officer of the Board of Professional Engineers, Architects, Surveyors, and Landscape Architects. We stand on our written testimony and limit our comments and concerns to section four of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Malama Solar in support. Uh, and then the AIA uh, Hawaii State Council on Zoom. Hi. Hi, Chairs. Thank you for um, allowing us to provide testimony. My name is Reed Mizue from the uh, American Institute of Architects, AIA, Hawaii State Council. And um, we stand uh, on our written testimony <clears throat> in opposition to, to the bill, specifically on Section 4. And um, all of our comments uh, and opposition come from a life safety and building code standpoint. Um, the bill um, puts in measures at the very end um, in section four to amend, um, to, uh, to amend HRS uh, 464-13, which will give uh, clear exemptions to skirting the use of a licensed professional architect and or structural engineer to do projects that um, increase the dollar amount exemption. Um, this is, uh, we'd like to point out a couple instances um, of mishaps on projects that um, if maybe an architect or engineer was utilized, then they wouldn't have happened. In recent news, there was a North Shore house collapsing into the water, as well as um, in Kailua on Oahu, there was a large retaining wall that, that, that had fallen and killed someone. And so, you know, for these types of concerns, increasing the dollar amount is not the thing to do, and changing HRS 464-13 is not the right way to go, specifically because um, architects, licensed architects, and licensed engineering consultants um, take life safety and health safety and welfare of the general public very seriously. It's why we are licensed. Um, if you guys got any questions related to this, we'd be happy to answer them. Appreciate it. Thank you, chairs, and thank you. Thank you. Committee. Um, and then we have our Revolution Hawaii in support. Okay, um, we're here. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, there are very few game-changing uh, pieces of legislation that are, that are going forward for climate, and this is one of them. This is essential. And um, there's a huge backlog up to up up to a year for people to get their permit for solar and we must move more quickly towards solar if we're going to do anything to prevent a growing climate crisis so uh the solar app that's part of this uh bill well within a day in some of the places where they already have this they've got their permits and so this is will speed things up get more solar on our on our homes and uh and get us off of fossil fuels much more quickly thank you so much for hearing this and uh and have a very good day Thank you. And then we have Tesla in support. American Council of Engineering Companies on Zoom. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Sandy Wong on behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies. Uh, we will stand on our written testimony in opposition. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. And then, um, oh, I have two entries here for uh, American Council of Engineering Companies. I think that's the same one. And then uh, alternate energy in support, um, Photon Works Engineering in support. And then it looks like we have about 40 additional testimonies from individuals in support, one in opposition. Uh, if I missed anyone, is there anyone else here to testify on this measure? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm Matt Geyer. I just wanted to testify in strong support of this measure. And I'm sorry I'm late, but also uh, HB 444, Green Constitutional Amendment, strong support. And all the measures you've heard today, thank you so much for your care for the environment at this critical time in history when we really need to do all we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is all the testimony we have on this measure. Members, questions? I'll start. Um, <laughs> I guess first, uh, uh, Hawaii Solar Energy Association. Hello. Hi. Uh, I think you might know the, the answer to this question. In the section four where we did increase those dollar amount caps, 
there were some questions in the testimony saying where did these numbers come from? Were they pulled out of nowhere? Um, did, I think, do you recall if those were calculated just based on a percent increase of inflation because they hadn't changed since 1979? Or where those uh, numbers My belief is, from? yeah, they were, they were changed. They were uh, upgraded for inflation, yes. And what was, do you re so remember what the amount of inflation increase was between now and 1979? So there's been about 320% inflation since 1979. Um, so, um, so multiplying by four times would equate to a 300% inflation rate. Got it. Okay, thanks. And then um, I guess it was the for AIA, also on Zoom. Hi, read me Zoe here. Hi. Um, so I guess I, I think the issue you have is with those dollar amount increases in, in section four, um, which would not, I guess, require the professional engineer stamp on those permits. Um, like, what's your comment on the fact that this, um, that, you know, due to the, when this, when this dollar amount was established, it was 1979. So as inflation has increased over time, this law has been sweeping more and more projects into the permitting process that would have been exempt when it was created in 1979. So, I mean, were people in 1979 just not worried about the health and safety? Or what, what, how, what's your comment on that? <coughs> So, so in 1979, where these things were done, is um, um, we, we defend this thing probably every 10 years. It comes up about every 10 years because there's new, new leadership in, in, in the legislature. And um, but we always strongly stick to it because codes, building codes, especially structural code and any life safety codes, evolve over a period of time, okay? And uh, we have, in the state of Hawaii, we have a three-year code cycle. So they're constantly changing, and they change because of mishaps and, and accidents relating to buildings and relating to uh, people perishing or getting injured because of um, things in the building code. So when those things happen, building code gets evaluated, and those things go up. The dollar amount um, um, increase increases the possibility that those things will occur and if you don't have a licensed professional on the job. So I want to just state that we don't have anything, any issue with uh, sustainability or energy efforts. Um, the AIA is a very strong proponent of energy and PV, um, but to change the HRS, um, HRS 464-13, is to allow and open the floodgates to all sorts of projects. So, you know, um, upping the dollar amounts to, to what the bill indicates up to $200,000, you know, you can do, you can do, a homeowner could do a tremendous amount of work for $200 and not use a licensed professional. You know, everything from structural to electrical to plumbing, electrical cause, can cause fires, you know, plumbing can ruin city, city infrastructure. And structural, of course, if you don't have um, top down from roof to footing, you know, you'll, you'll have collapses and people will be injured do potentially. You, um, do you think any amount, or is your position no amount of increase is acceptable? At this time, no amount increase, but we are willing in, in the future as if this bill proceeds, we will look, we'll, we'll look into some of these. But, you know, I mean the, the, bill, the threshold bill's of an energy bill. Okay, and, and we feel to stick this thing in the end um, to an energy bill is, is the wrong place to do it. There are other bills right now in the ledge that address the same issue um, that we'll be um, discussing and providing testimony for. But, um, you know, and further, you know, I don't think that these um, changing the HRS 46413 um, increases the chances that you're going to um, get through permitting quicker. Okay, so changing the HRS I does think, not I increase think, your permitting yeah, thank time. Thank you, thank you. I think um, it, it, I think it could help county permitting if there were just fewer projects clogging up the pipeline. It's part of part of the idea, I guess. Sec, uh, sorry, quick follow up, and then I'll go to committee members. Um, the the example that you cite in your testimony of the seawall, I think in your testimony you also said it was an unpermitted seawall. So isn't that kind of a moot point? Like if it was unpermitted already, how would this even be relevant to that? 
No, my understanding is if you change the HRS, you still got to get a building permit. You just, you're just trying to skirt the use of a licensed professional. No, but I'm saying your testimony provided as an example of where somebody has, could have been hurt or has been hurt by a proper, uh, improperly constructed structure. You used in his example to see all that collapse. But you also, in your own Correct. testimony, say that it was unpermitted. So is that kind of like not relevant Correct. to this situation? No, not the seawall. This was a retaining wall in Kailua. That, that wasn't a seawall. This was a retaining wall okay. at a, as a residential project. Um, uh, unpermitted. And it held back. Yeah, it, it, it was unpermitted. Retaining wall. As far as I know, it was unpermitted. OK. Uh, yeah. Just Last question, if, if we pass this bill with these increase amounts, and I think we might be willing to consider, you know, open it up to discussion what dollar amount those should be, but, you know, if we pass it in the current form, it would reduce work for your members. Is that the case? There would be less, there would reduce the amount of work for your members. There would be fewer projects coming to you. No, not necessarily. A lot of our, a lot of, a lot of our, um, our members do commercial work. This is to affect only residential, um, one and two story residential projects. So, um, yeah, that's not, not, that's not necessarily true. A lot of us also do not work on PV specific projects only. Okay. So we're, we're, again, we have nothing against PV, but we do have, we are against changing the HRS, which opens the floodgates to all sorts of improvements, not just PV. Okay, like I said, you could build a two-story structure worth $200,000 yes, on the side of your home, and, and that's, yeah, that can go without a licensed you. professional. Thank you. Sorry, we do have to move on. Sorry, members, any other questions? Chair. Uh, Rep. Ward, go ahead. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a question to somebody I don't think is here, which is going to be the implementer. That is, any money from the city and county of any of the counties? Because you're the implementers. But I want to commend the Chair for a bill that's slightly overdue. It's about time that we expedite permitting. The economy is slowed down because there's a lack of permitting, and this one is a, a facilitation of that. And to is, the, there, is there a question? There's a question to the a, a, AIA. Sir, if this is successful and we start expediting permitting, you guys in the architecture business are going to benefit immensely. This is a beginning to expedite what otherwise is a system that doesn't work because it's so slow. Now, I understand your exemptions, but the point is permitting is a bureaucratic regulation we can't get over. Do you see it in the long range implications? Well, if this one passes, what you guys are gonna benefit in the long run is the question. If permitting, if permitting improves, we will benefit. But I'm, and what I'm saying is, by having section four in this bill does not improve permitting. permitting. Permitting is the authority having jurisdiction in all counties and there are other ways to improve the permitting process besides changing the HRS. So you don't believe in self-certification, that they fill out the, uh, the website or on the application and that is then calculated and then the permit proceeds. You don't believe in the system of electronically uh, initiating the solar uh, per, uh, permitting. In other words, um, does, does that, the application that already, fit? Yeah, that, that can already occur. Okay, are we? Yeah, so, like I said, solar, we're fine. Okay. Uh, we're making progress slowly, but three steps forward and two backwards, I think Thank I'm hearing. Thanks, Thank Rep. Ward. Any further questions, members? All right, if not, we will recess for decision making. We'll recess, yeah, we'll recess. We'll come back for decision making at the end of the joint waterland uh, EEP agenda. So two bills on that agenda. We'll come back and vote on both agendas after, after that. So recess. On the 9, I'm sorry, 840 Water and Land Agenda. We've got two quick bills. And I just want to remind our Water and Land Committee members, we have a 930 Agenda upstairs. Okay, first up on House Bill 319, we have Department of Health on Zoom. Hello, Chair Ichiyama, Chair Lowen, and members of both committees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in this measure on behalf of the Department of Health. My name is Dr. Diana Felton. I'm the state toxicologist with the Department of Health, and I've been working on Red Hill health issues for the past 14 months. 
The Department of Health understands the intent of this bill and agrees strongly that the people affected by the Red Hill water contamination deserve long-term health monitoring and other services that would be available through a health registry. However, the department has significant concerns about DOH being the operator of such a registry as directed in this measure. Other federal agencies, such as the Defense Health Agency and the CDC's Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry, are much better suited to operating a health registry, and they've actually already begun work on establishing such a registry. A true health registry that can identify health impacts from an environmental exposure, such as what happened with Red Hill Water, um, as well as provide services to the people and families and communities affected is a very large endeavor, requiring expertise and personnel that are not available at DOH and costing at least 10 to $20 million just to get started. The Department of Health has and will continue to advocate for the people impacted by this contamination and will also continue to advise DHA and ATSDR on the most effective forms of a registry as they're being developed but we feel they are in a better position to establish, manage, and fund a health registry for the people affected by the water contamination. Thanks for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Felton. Next we have Board of Water Supply, Erwin Kowata on Zoom. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, chairs and community members. I'm Erwin Kowata with the Board of Water Supply. We stand our we stand on our written testimony in support with comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Next on Zoom, Dave Malinix, our Revolution Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you so much. Uh, we stand on our testimony and we st stand in strong support. Uh, thank you. We were the Board of Water Supply. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have uh, individual testimony from Keone DeFranco on Zoom. <coughs> Not in the room. Okay, next we have late testimony from Catherine McClanahan on Zoom. Not in the room. Okay, uh, late testimony from Colonel Ann Wright on Zoom. Nope, not in the room. Okay, we also had a number of individual testimony in support. Anybody else wishing to testify on House Bill 319? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll go to questions. Members, any questions? I'll try to be fast, Chair. I know we're in a rush. Um, to the Department of Health. Yes. Hey, good morning. Thank you for the work that you've been doing for the last several months. Um, Thanks. I'm trying to do the basic math on how much the state has received in federal funding since 2021. Um, uh, Congressman Case noted that in fiscal year 2022, uh, there was $736 million. Another allocation in February of 2022 of 403 million. Senator Schatz noted um, in the media, I, and I, I haven't seen it, another 100 million. And then in June, um, another approval of $1.1 $1 .1 billion. How much has the Department of Health received from the federal government thus far to aid in assisting those who have been affected by the crisis and in water contamination remediation? So I'll definitely have to get back to you on exact numbers, but my understanding is that so far, Department of Health has bill basically billed the Navy in cost recovery for all of the work related to the Red Hill water contamination in general. And I know as of a few a month or so ago, we had been reimbursed about a million and a half for that, and we're awaiting further reimbursement. But my understanding of the other federal funds are often going to established environmental regulatory programs already, but I'd be happy to get more clarification for you. Okay. Um, we heard uh, in the governor's state of the state address that he intends to um, assist victims who were affected by the Red Hill crisis. Do you think that tracking their health conditions would fall under that intent? That's, that's a good question. I, I don't know exactly what his intent was. Um, I do think that, that people should be tracked, but in a, in a rigorous and sort of scientifically rigorous way that can actually provide services to them and, and you know, monitor for health, for health problems that come long term. So the, I'm not exactly sure what his intent was. 
Okay. Does the Defense Health Agency ordinarily um, work with civilians? So not often that, as I mentioned, the part that we have been advising both Defense Health Agency and ATSDR on that has been uh, one of our strong advocate occasions for it. And uh, we are insisting that they would include civilians uh, if the Def Defense Health Agency was to host the health registry. Um, and they have already initiated the, the sort of bureaucratic process for making that possible to include civilians. The difference is the civilians, unlike the military affiliated people, the civilians would have to be self-report. So the civilians would have to opt in actively to the registry since the military at this point does not have, already have their names. Um, you know, considering we're the state of Hawaii, do you think that we are in a better position to track these civilians, these numerous individuals who are on base, off base, at, in a variety of places they didn't even know they were on Navy water supply, um, to attempt to deliver them medical services in the future? I do not think that the department is in the best position to do this, mostly because of the lack of expertise in this kind of extreme endeavor. One more. Can we hire these people? There are unlikely to be very many people in the state of Hawaii with this kind of expertise. This is an extremely specialized type of an epidemiology. And you know, even within our whole Department of Health, we do not have any, at this time, we do not have anyone that's capable of doing this type of project. So it's possible we could recruit someone somehow, but I, I think it would be very difficult. Dr. I want to let other members have Thank a chance you. to ask questions. Any other questions from members? Rep. Ward? Thank you, Chair. Uh, you said it would cost $10 million to do this if you did do it, which you seem reluctant to do. What would you do with the $10 million? What, why so much? Yeah, that's what's been quoted to me by CDC as initial startup costs for a formal health registry, um, not startup and sort of maintenance. And a lot of that is, is personnel. A lot of that is um, IT work. Um, the, these are our big endeavors. So the, for instance, the World Trade Center um, Health registry, or the one that has been done by a, by an independent third party at Flint, Michigan, around ten million dollars has been the cost uh, for outreach, for IT support and staffing, and just the number of people required to do the work. So, if we pass the bill, you can still take it on and bite the bullet and do it. I at this time we do not have the personnel or the expertise to do it. And I don't know that we could we could get them. And I mean, a, we would we would of course try, but I I don't know that that's possible. Collecting data, you you make it sound like it's rocket science, actually. These types of health registries and and coordinating them and putting on the this is very advanced specific type of epidemiology. Give an example of how complicated it is. Well, the team for Flint that is doing the Flint registry, um, I think it's about 50 people, all with PhDs in epidemiology, almost all with PhDs in epidemiology, all who have uh, participated in advanced training at the CDC through felt through epidemic intelligence service fellowships. And they're interviewing um, people, right? I mean, this is basically interviewing people and checking off what has occurred in their body and et cetera. I, again, I uh, do not have expertise in this area, so the exact details of what it entails is outside of my area of expertise, but I believe the establishing the, resi the, the registry in a way that, that makes it useful for people and useful for understanding the health correlations is extremely advanced and difficult. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Thank you very much. We're going to move to the last bill on our joint agenda, House Bill 546, relating to the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee. First up, uh, Chair Don Chang, DLNR. Hello, Chairs, uh, members of the committee, Kaleo Manuel, Deputy with the Water Commission. We stand on our written testimony and support. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you. Next, we have Department of Health. Good morning, Chairs. My name is Roxanne Kwan. I'm with the Department of Health. We stand on our testimony. Thank you, Ms. Kwan. Next, we have Board of Water Supply, Deputy Manager Erwin Kowata on Zoom. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, chairs and members. 
Um, the Board of Water Supply stands on our written testimony and strong support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwata. Finally on Zoom, Dave Mullenix, our Revolution Hawaii. Yes, thank you very much. We stand in strong support along with the Board of Water Supply. Uh, they have been um, the, the, the number one group that's been on top of this and, uh, and, the, and we support what they're saying. We support this uh, legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we also received written testimony, one in support, one in comments. Anybody else wishing to offer testimony on House Bill 546? Okay, seeing none, members, any questions? Yep, Vice Chair For the Department of Health. Um, in your testimony, you request $350,000 to facilitate the quarterly meetings. Um, is that to be assumed that each meeting will cost $87,500? Um, that's just an estimate. Because the 350000 we came in was for the year. So, for, and we propose possibly have four FTAC meetings if the, if the math correct. I think, yes. Is that a cost that could also be billed to the Navy? Um, I believe so. I have to look into it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair members. Any other questions? Okay, seeing now we're going to recess for decision making. Recess. All right, we are reconvening the 8.30 a.m. agenda of Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection and Committee on Water and Land for some speed voting decision making. Um, first up on the agenda, we have House Bill 444. This is the Green Amendment Bill. We are going to make some technical amendments for clarity, consistency, and style. We will note the concerns of the Attorney General in the committee report, but we want to move this forward for further discussion. Uh, we are defecting the date to June 30th, 3000. Uh, 
I think I said in my first hearing the default defective date would be July 1st, 3,000, but it's June 30th, 3,000, and I'm going to say now I'm going to defect the date on all the bills we're passing out today, so I won't repeat that every time. Uh, members, any discussion? If not, Jeff, I, uh, go ahead, Rep. Board. I am for the bill, but I don't see the Attorney General in the, the question I ask about the liability. I mean, you got to protect the environment, but you also have to protect the state in the sense that if everybody who's got any pollutant anywhere near them and they come and sue the state, I think we're in jeopardy. So I, I think Thank further you. clarification. Thank you. All right. If no further discussion, please take the vice chair. Please take the vote. Yes. Uh, voting on HB 444, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Mm -hmm. Noting the excused absences of Rep. Woodson and Rep. Gates. Representatives, are there any members voting no? Any with reservations? And I see that's Rep. Ward with reservations. And Chair, your measure is adopted. Thank you. And House Bill 1396. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Go Waterland Committee members. Same recommendation. Vice Chair, House Draft 1. Voting on House Bill 444. Chair recommends passing with amendments. Uh, I'm taking the vote. Chair Ichiyama. Aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Representative Chen. Aye. Representative Gannon. Aye. Representative Hashem? Aye. Representative Morikawa? Aye. Representative Takayama? Aye. Representative Souza? Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Okay, next up we have House Bill 1396 uh, relating to cesspools. Recommendation on this bill is to adopt the suggested amendments of Department of Health, allowing them to contract for services. We will blank out the dollar amounts, but note them in the committee report and affect the date. Members, any discussion? If not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 1396, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting excused absences of Reps Woodson and Gates. Members, are there any, um, any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. And thank you, and over to Water and Land thank for your you, vote. Thank you, Water and Land members. Same recommendation, House Draft 1. Any comments, questions? Okay, Vice Chair. Voting on House Bill 1396. Um, Chair recommends passing with amendments, noting all members as present. Are there any no's or reservations? Okay, the Chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to House Bill 440, also relating to cesspools. Uh, a few amendments to this. We're going to uh, clarify any references to department, director, government agency. Clarify these are referring to Department of Health. This was mentioned in DOTAX's testimony. Um, we will also correct uh, the name of the prioritization tool from the year 2021 to 2022 per Department of Health testimony. Um, and there was also a suggestion from Department of Health to not specifically reference Chapter 342D72, but rather deadlines established in law in case some of those deadlines are changed in law this session. And then we'll blank out the dollar amount for the $5 million cap, but we'll note that in the committee report and also some technical amendments uh, for clarity, consistency, and style and defect the date. Uh, any discussion, members? If not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 440, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Uh, and also noting excused absences of reps Woodson and Gates. Representatives, any members voting no? Any members with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. Thank you, and over to Water and Land. Water and Land members, same recommendation. House Draft 1, any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair. Voting on House Bill 440, Chair recommends passing with amendments. Noting all members as present, are there any no's or reservations? Okay, Chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thanks. House Bill 180 relating to cesspools. For this bill, we're going to <coughs> amend it to um, adopt Department of Health suggested amendments to Section 3, clarifying the appropriation language and adding position titles and affect the date. Members, any discussion? If not, Vice Chair. 
Voting on HB 180, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. We know, excuse absences of Reps Woodson and Gates. Uh, members, any represent, uh, voting no? Any voting with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. And over to Water and Land. Thank you, Water and Land members, same recommendation. Any questions, comments, seeing none? House Draft 1, Vice Chair. Voting on House Bill 180, Chair recommends <coughs> passing with amendments. Noting all members as present, are there any no's or reservations? Okay, seeing none, the Chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. And House Bill 181, also relating to cesspools. Uh, for this, we'll just adopt a DOH suggestion to correct the <coughs> title of the cesspool prioritization tool from the year 2021 to 2022 and affect the date members. Any discussion? If not, Vice Chair. Voting on HB 181, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting ex excuse absences of Reps Woodson and Gates. Members, any uh, voting no? Any with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. And over to Waterland. Thank you, members. Same recommendation. Any questions, comments? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair House Draft 1. Voting on HB 181, Chair recommends passing with amendments. Noting all members as present, are there any no's or reservations? Okay, seeing none, the Chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you, and voting uh, next on House Bill 587, Wastewater Management. We're just gonna defect the date on this bill. Uh, and members, any discussion? If not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 587, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Uh, noting excuse absences of Reps Woodson and Gates. Members, uh, any members voting no? Any members with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. Thank you, over to Waterland. Thank you, members, same recommendation. Any questions, comments? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair, House Draft 1. Voting on House Bill 587, Chair recommends passing with amendments. Noting all members as present, are there any no's or reservations? Okay, seeing none, the Chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you for House Bill 195, relating to renewable energy. Um, on, we're gonna make a few amendments, so I think to address the concerns raised by KIUC, we're going to, in that self-certification provision, add a 250 kilowatt threshold to the size of the system. We think this will address the concerns of KIUC, but they weren't present to ask, so we'll follow up with them later. Um, and uh, we'll blank out the dollar amounts of the threshold increases in section four, but note those um, in the committee report and note that those were uh, increase based on the rate of inflation since the uh, initial date those dates were established. And then we have some technical amendments and affect the date. Members, any discussion? Chair, comment. Yes. I hope this is the beginning of something great. All right. I hope it is. Thank you. Good bill. Um, uh, Vice Chair, if no further discussion, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 195, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting excuse absences of Reps <coughs> Woodson and Gates. Members um, voting no. Any members with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. And over to Water and Land. Water and Land members, same recommendation. Any questions, concerns? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair House Draft 1. Voting on HB 195, Chair recommends passing with amendments. Noting all members as present, are there any no's or reservations? Seeing none, the chair's recommendation is adopted. Okay, great, and we will adjourn. We will adjourn the joint committee on energy and environmental protection and water land. And we're going to open our 8:40 agenda on the water land eat agenda. We had two bills: uh, House Bill 319 relating to health. Given the concerns of the Department of Health on the cost, at 10 million dollars and the number of people needed to implement this, and also given that it would be duplicative of what federal agencies are doing, uh, we're gonna defer this measure. Moving on to House Bill 546, relating to the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee. Recommendation is to pass with amendments, defecting the date June 30th, 3000. We're also gonna add in the DOH amendment for an appropriation, but we're gonna leave the amount blank and put that into the committee report. Members, Waterland members, any questions? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair House Draft 1. Voting on HB 546, Chair recommends passing with amendments, noting all members as present, are there any no's or reservations? 
Okay, seeing none, the chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection, same recommendation. Members, any discussion? If not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Um, chair, voting on HB 546. Uh, chair elects to pass with amendment. Chair and Vice Chair both vote aye. Noting excuse absences of Reps Woodson and Gates. Any members voting no? Any members with reservations? Uh, Chair, the measure is adopted. Thank you. And, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you, members. Waterland members. Oh. See you upstairs. <laughs>
positives to RVMs, the reverse vending machines, that it would behoove us to explore, uh, even like you say, a, a pilot to uh, to see if the you know some of these issues that we suppose would happen or the benefits that we suppose would happen actually you know manifest themselves. Do you think it would be easier if it was a pilot you know for for Honolulu or however we would phrase it in in the bill because it's a more dense urban area? Do you think that? Um, it would be easier to find the people to do the repair and maintenance on those machines than somewhere like Kahana? I, I think so, just because, you know, there's a larger population base here on, on Oahu. Uh, you know, there's certainly more people and, and potentially the, the opportunity to find somebody who could do the servicing on, on something like this. Uh, or even if we have to fly them in from the mainland, uh, you know, the transportation to Oahu sometimes is, is generally easier than, than to the neighbor islands. Um, I think the challenge will be just finding someone willing to participate with us. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's something on our end. We need to reach out uh, to find retailers uh, who might be interested in, in trying it out or a local NGO, for yeah, example. Yeah, I mean, I would think for, rest, for uh, grocery stores, if you had the one, you know, you were the one or two stores with reverse vending machines in Honolulu, you would actually bring in customers because people would go there just to use it. You know? Yeah, and there's also, you know, I mean, there, the way they, they, they make them these days, you could even have benefits, for example, if you cash your redemption out as a voucher, um, where, you know, you can get maybe extra from Safeway Store if you're at an RVM yeah. at Safeway. I think one of the challenges, though, with the Pacific Northwest that we didn't mention in the testimony is that there are retailers like Safeway that will restrict the type of containers that come in to only their products and national brands. So, you know, the Safeway Select brand, they'll accept, but if it's a Kirkland can, they'll reject. But if we were, if we were, uh, I, I'm envisioning maybe making some changes to this bill to add language under the special fund language to allow you to do this and then you could just determine what kind of pilot program you wanted to create by rule and then maybe I would leave it to the introducer of the bill to, to follow up and try to make that work and figure out details but kind of leave it as an option but I would think if it was partly if it was a reverse spending machine partly funded with a grant from the state that you could ensure in your provisions that it wasn't limited to just like their yeah. brand products oh, or yes. requires some kind of you know ongoing maintenance of the machine and things like that over yeah. at least for a certain period of time so um okay well if you're open to that we'll try to come up with something to some kind of language to to, okay. to keep this bill moving forward and keep the discussion going yeah no that's no problem members for their uh rep Cochran, go ahead thank you and thanks um so if i recall there's a vending maybe i'm thinking of a different kind of vending machine but on the corner of Kuunene <coughs> avenue and kamehameha in on maui there's a chevron perhaps gas station that has one of these types of vending machines that has been there for years and I see it being used, um, widely used. I've inserted bottles and it necessarily, the, the bottle didn't, wasn't bought from that gas station. Mm -hmm. So they take all kinds, I thought, of any there, it, oh, high sorry. five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it, it's a matter of preference for the, the owner of the machine, right? And so uh -huh. uh, similar to if I, have a soda vending machine, I could choose to have Pepsi or Coke. In this instance, like I was saying for, for Oregon, there are stores like Safeway, for example, that will limit the types of containers coming in only to their brands. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, but because it's all software driven, you could have a vending machine that accepts all types. And so I think as, as Chair Lowen had suggested, if we do a pilot project, certainly we would not limit it to a certain store brand or retail brand. Yeah, thank you. And just um, note of, noting that it's been successful and I believe it's still going. So yeah, it I'd like to, to look into hardship. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that that's important to know. I know that we had issues with uh, Hasegawa's out in, in, in Hana. Mm -hmm. Um, but but certainly we'll we'll see what uh, is it Aloha Shell? Uh, I, sorry, I can't recall the okay. name of the but it's on the corner of Pu'unene and Kamehameha Avenue. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. Any further questions, members? Report. Is Japan which country is leading in this reverse mm -hmm. vending machine? Um, most of the reverse reverse vending machines are actually manufactured in Europe. Uh, and I think the largest manufacturer is, 
I want to say in, you know, somewhere in Scandinavia. Mm. Uh, How is the cut of the amount of income that it generates? It would, the, the processing of the material that's collected would still be handled exactly the same as we're doing now with the redemption centers. You know, it, it would digitally track the container going into the machine uh, and then whomever is operating the collection of that material would then uh, get the redemption from us. They would submit the, the So receipts. the money, like in this bill, goes to the government, the state, correct? Correct. Who pays the capitalization or the cost of the vending machine? Is it the private entity or is the government has something to do with it? I think if it is structured as a pilot project, the state would be paying for it using existing uh, deposit beverage container funds. And then you'll be able to show profitability if private vendors want to follow up with that. I, yeah, I mean, I think that that would be all in line with a pilot project is to demonstrate does this work? Mm. How will this work? Uh, is this an attractive option for retailers to implement? Um, you know, I think a lot of those questions can be answered with, with sort of doing a demonstration or a pilot. And how soon would the pilot give us information to act on it? It's going to depend on, on, well, we would have to do obviously a procurement, uh, you know, put it out to bid. Uh, and so then it would just depend on the timing of the manufacturer to manufacture the RVM, get it installed and, and set up for us to find a, a willing partner. Uh, I really couldn't say, you know. But then you'll need a year or six months at least Probably of data. Of data okay. collection, certainly, okay. yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Thank no you, problem. Jim. Thanks. Any further questions, members? All right. If not, we will recess for decision making. All right, reconvening for decision making. Um, House Bill 748, this is uh, relating to environmental protection um, and just kind of uh, expanding on the law that we passed pertaining to PFAS last year. Um, we're going to um, insert a, a definition. I think we'll pull from the Environmental Protection Agency's definition of PFA and PFOAs and insert that. Um, we want to uh, include a definition of cosmetics and personal care products, and I think there may be existing definitions in statute relating to sunscreen laws and some other laws we've passed, but we want to make sure those are referenced in this. We will include um, an exemption for hydrofluoroolefins, which are used as propellants in some cosmetics um, and are also refrigerants, and then um, we will add an exemption for healthcare products, uh, which was provided in the CHPA testimony, Consumer Health Products Association, I believe. And then we'll include a definition of food packaging linked to um, HRS 321-601, and then technical amendments for clarity, consistency, and style, and effective date of June 30th, 3000. Um, members, any discussion? All right, if not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 748, Chair elects to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting the excused absence of Rep. Woodson. Members, anyone voting no? Any with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. Um, thank you. And for House Bill 1410 relating to deposit beverage containers, we're gonna amend this. Um, to probably remove most of the provisions that were inserted in this original draft, but we'll amend that language relating to the special fund to allow those special funds to be used um, for some kind of pilot program um, to uh, you know, work on deploying reverse vending machines and allow some state funds to be used to pay for or partially pay for those programs. Um, and then we'll allow DOH to establish this pilot program by rule um, you know, at their, to have uh, discretion over how they want to best implement that. And we'll make sure we remove the language about um, capping 
the amount and reverting funds to general funds from deposit beverage container uh, special fund. And um, we will defect the date to June 30th, 3000. So with that, members, any discussion, Rep. Ward? Chair, I have a question. Is there any incentivization of the vendor? I know this is a I think pilot. Time for, I think, can we take the questions offline because time for questions is, is passed, but we can, oh. maybe you can talk to Department of Health as soon as we adjourn. Okay, uh, that won't inf impact my vote, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, if no further discussion, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 1410, <clears throat> Chair elects to pass with amendments, Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting excused absence of Rep. Woodson. Any members voting no? Any members with reservations? Chair, your measure is adopted. Thank you, and we are adjourned.